There was a robbery of a Briggs Depot on January 5th, 1993. Now, I never heard about it, because, I mean, something happening away up in Rochester, New York, doesn't necessarily make news down here, even though it was a Brinks armed depot robbery. It might have gotten in a column. In fact, to be honest with you, Mike, I never did to get a chance to research and see, was it ever in the New York papers at all? Okay. In November 11th, 12-11, 11-12, I'm sorry, 12th of November, 1993, uh, I guess the FBI had nothing else to do and, and the Special Forces had nothing to do. They surrounded this block, they cut off the block, the snipers all over the place, and they raided this house, looking for whom they thought was an IRA leader, and supposedly the mastermind of the Brinks armed robbery, which I'm delighted to say, and more it's delighted still that they didn't get their money back, that uh, $7.5 million was taken in that robbery. It was the fifth largest robbery in the history of the United States. And there were four previous robberies, identical MO, all unsolved. And so the original conclusion was it had to be a very, very carefully planned mafia job. But after all the rats and informers and everything they tried to do, they had to exonerate the mafia from any involvement. So now they had to look for another scapegoat. The interesting thing was, the same, I was pastor of a church downtown at the time, and at the same time that this happened, uh, the blind cheek was charged with the attempted blowing up of the trade center. So all agents were deployed from every non-essential thing to that particular thing. So the Brinks robbery of January 5th sat on the back burner until November of that year. So then arrived here with their, sorry, the, the, the American Gestapo and the FBI and the rest of the other thugs and, and uh, thug crooks that come in to invade this house. Now, the fact of the matter is, if those people had the presence of mind to call me on the phone and invite me down to their office and say, we have the following allegations or something, I probably would have cooperated with them and said, look, what you're talking about, and probably could have filled them in on who and what and why, who I know. I had nothing to hide. Now, I had as much to do with that robbery as I did to do with the, with the Irish thing. Nothing. But the problem was, I unapologetically, down the years, ran what we call safe havens or good houses. I had four or five of them spread all over the city and outside the city for an undocumented alien whom, whom eventually we would bring to the government for, uh, you know, for relief. Maybe somebody on the run who we hadn't enough time to establish their innocence until we could de develop a defense in that so they wouldn't be thrown to the dogs. Uh, it could be it could be a wanted Irishman or a wanted Palestinian or, or whatever. It could be a freedom fighter from, uh, from Hungary. It could have been somebody which I did have from, from the then time communist Poland. Unapologetically, I would aid and help these kind of people. And I always emphasize to everybody, I never broke one American law or ordinance in everything I did. I circumvented every law in the bloody book. But that's what a good legal mind can do. You work around them, but never break them. So they couldn't touch me. So I was then arrested for that. Now, they really had nothing on me at all. They found $2 million in an apartment in Stuyvesant Town. I had control of that apartment. I had given it over to a friend of mine who had been a former uh, blanket man from Ireland, you know what blanket men is, these men, these were men who lived wearing only a blanket, no uniform for years in, during the protest of the hunger strike in Ireland. Extreme political protest. And I had a great admiration for this man who got out after serving, serving seven years. Of course he was here in this country undocumented and all the rest, but that was beside the point. How many refugees have we had of different types here? Down the years. So, um, they had their eye on him and a police officer upstate New York that he'd worked with. I never met that man in my life. They didn't even know who he was. They tied me, 
to Miller, the guy named Miller. I knew him as uh, under a different name, Sam Campbell, and they tied Campbell to upstate. And upstate, they realized that Miller had been in that general area. Now note, they didn't have enough evidence to charge anybody whatever with the actual robbery. Not a shred. Not an iota. So they charged, when they found the money in Stuyvesant Town, they got a, a warrant to do a surreptitious uh, search by willfully, willful lying and perjuring themselves. And a, dis, and a prosecutor subordinating perjury to get the warrant to search the house over there and to search here. In that, they said, the poor priest from the village, well known for his work, etc., and maybe known as the IRA priest back then, uh, bought a vehicle, a 1993 Ford Explorer, with $20,000 cash in $20 bills. Now, the actual fact of the matter is, Mike, and I could show you this in, in, in a later time, the car was bought with $500 check down payment and a loan from the Bank of America for the rest of the money. And the car was owned by the bank at the time. There was no cash transactions, whatever. And I knew from my own connections, not to mention where, I'd gotten a tip that the FBI had gone months before to the Ford company to find out who actually bought the car. I bought it, but for my buddy. He it was in my name, but I never even got, never even drove it one mile. I let him have it. He didn't have the documents to own in his own name. I did that for other people at different times, been no apology. So the vehicle worth $20,000. They made up, fabricated this big lie. My bishop called me saying, uh, uh, Father Patrick, oh, how many bags did you have to have for that kind of money? $20,000 in $20 bills. I said, Bishop, what are you talking about? That is just the New York Times. Big lie. And the chief, the guy, I think his name was Stevens at the time, went on public television and lied. All the time they're in possession of the data and the facts, they got away with it. And the judge, my own judge later on up the road, he was in the government's pocket, no doubt, in the beginning. He should have made all that inadmissible. They hadn't a shred of anything to tie anybody concretely to the robbery. So I was convicted with my, my associate, Miller. I found out later that was his name, Sam Campbell, for conspiracy to attempt to possess money believed to be from the Brinks. They never even established that the money that came out of Stuyvesant Town was Brinks' money. It wasn't serialized. It was all in $20 bills. In, in the Times, one of the Times yep. articles, it said uh, that uh, a certain amount of that money that they, they had uh, connected with the Brinks job. They claimed, but here's the problem. When they raided the apartment at the time, they had no phot photographic uh, uh, evidence of the raid, no audio because it was late Friday night and they could get nothing. And they took the money from the apartment to bring to count it. And then they came back and concocted the story that some of the money came. Note, a year later, what now? My, the associate I'm talking about had been a croupier and worked with offshore gambling, a legal entity. And like by the way, many times down the years, like Big, uh, Big Mac, the head of the Irish Mafia and that, he used mostly former Irish prisoners of war as his runners. He knew they were honest, they were on the run, they were going to stay out of the cop, police and that, and in that big enterprise. There was a, bi a, a big study done in that, by the way, which came out at trial. So they made these allegations but could never establish them. Then they took money from my house here, which they had documentary evidence, including checks from 1992 that they added to the money found there. They brought a defendant, I'm sorry, a, a witness from Florida, a Cuban I'd worked with for many years. I knew him in Brooklyn. He moved down to Florida. I helped him baptize his kids, helped him financially over the years. He got 15000 
and maybe a total of $30,000 in 1992 from an informal credit union we had. He'd pay back what he could, when he could, to run an automobile business. They had him to come up to testify that I'd given him this money. And Johnny Fernandez said to them, but sir, what good is this going to be to you? Well, it'll prove that this breach had all this kind of money, and where else would he have gotten it? And Johnny said to him, but Mr. Buscali, I'll never forget that, God forgive me, but like if there was ever a serpent from Satan, that maybe he believed his own fanaticism, but he lied to his teeth, this graduate. But anyway, this prosecutor, he said, we have the proof here. And Johnny pulled a piece of paper out of his pocket and said, Mr. Buscali, there's the copy of the wire transfer. Father Maloney sent me this money in July of 1992. And then there was other money from 1992. There was a check for $40,000 that an undocumented alien had gotten. And I'd gotten it cashed for him. And that check was made out by the legal company called Fussburg and Fussburg, January 19th, 1992. Duly deposited and put through accounts. The documents were there, but they added that money up to add to my sentence been fully aware with the documents in front of them. How, so as, as Johnny was just a simple guy from Cuba, and he said, Miss Vascalia, how could money, oh, wait a minute, have you any documents to prove, like did the priest get to, he said, look, he was like my father, he baptized my children since I came off as a refugee from Cuba, he's worked with my family, we needed only a handshake, he's like a father to me and I like a son to him, he knew where the money was safe and I would be safe with him, well would you lie for the father, <coughs> he said, he never taught me to lie, it's not what he would want to do, but he said, he, he looked at the guy and said, would you lie against him, here's a paper, from the bank. I didn't write this. I didn't generate this paper. This paper said this money was given me July 1992. How can it be tied in? So they disqualified him immediately as a witness. Then my attorneys said, wait a minute, since the government brought him all the way from Florida, put him up in a hotel overnight and all the rest, let's us, let, let, let us now call him and show what they're up to. They wouldn't let him, they wouldn't allow him. They even threatened said, we're going to look into your, your immigration status. Maybe you'll end up back in Cuba. Now, another foul lie, because you and I know very well, you cannot be deported back to Cuba. See what I mean? So they used every dirty trick in the book, desperate in their enthusiasm to solve an unsolvable case. So, I was convicted on totally circumstantial evidence on a conspiracy attempt to collect and the greatest lies you can get and the lie with impunity of the FBI, the CIA and that bunch. I personally believe, Lord forgive me, even to the present day, you have to be a sociopath to be one of them. It baffles me, Michael, to the present day. I've worked with all kinds of young people. I've seen cops lie, district attorneys embellish cases to get a conviction. But it was not a lie myself became the victim of their lies and their everything else. I fail to understand how a godly man of any spirituality or religion can get on the witness stand, swear to tell the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then lie through his teeth. They justify it. But then again, if you ever have the time, I can refer you to a famous book called uh, Main Justice, which explains the way the federal system works. Judges have no power. The prosecutors manipulate everything. The judges are rubber. Most of them are rubber stamps. There's another great book, uh, uh, Tainted Evidence. Five of the major cases, including Ruby Ridge, of the FBI cases, of tampered with evidence. It's their way of life. But in all fairness, they're good Irish cats. Are you aware, by the way, uh, I hate to go off the subject, but the, the bulk of the FBI at the time I'm talking about were either devout Roman Catholics or devout Mormons. Well, a plague on both of them. I'm sorry. Until they come to the knowledge of truth. They're 
fanatical in one track. So, to make a long story short there, I ended up on a three-month trial you know, up in Rochester, New York, and I, I, why would I be tried up in the Hicks of, of Rochester? What do the people, little country folk from around Elmira and Rochester know about the workings of an inner city Catholic priest, and especially one like me? And then the fact the, the government tried desperately to bring the IRA card into it. And after ex exhaustive investigation with, with the CIA, with the FBI, with the Special Branch Police, with the MI5s, they couldn't get a shred of evidence to tie me even remotely to any of them. Albeit, I preached from the, public of, uh, from the pulpit of St. Patrick's Cathedral about the Irish cause. I've lectured in various places. I've been unapologetic in the expression of my political views. I never at any time condoned, supported, or in any way uh, advanced any form of violence. Self-defense, if some madman is going to rape your wife, are you going to defend her? her? Okay, and another issue there. So, looking back at the whole thing, I see, uh, as you know, I did close to four years in a federal prison. And there, they tried every dirty trick in the book to get to my spirit and soul, but they didn't succeed.